Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, I'm joined by Greg Beard, CEO of Stronghold Digital Assets. Greg and I discuss Stronghold's use of waste coal to clean up Pennsylvania and mine Bitcoin, how Bitcoin mining incentivizes land reclamation, and the mining economics of vertical integration. Greg, welcome to the Mining Podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you for having me. Excited for today's conversation. As I was saying before we started, I'm getting close to having every public company on the show at this point. Uh, you guys are definitely high on my list because you guys have an interesting energy strategy, which we will get into further down. And then second of all, I went to college actually in the area that you guys operate in Western Pennsylvania. So the things that you guys are operating on and working and fixing in the uh, climate or the environment in that area uh, is like near and dear to my heart. So just wanted to kick off right there. Let's get the the quick pitch from you though, like 30 second elevator pitch if you can on what Stronghold does because a lot of our listeners probably are not familiar with you guys as of now. And then we'll dig into the, the nitty gritty stuff. Sure. So, hey, we're a vertically integrated Bitcoin miner, which means we own our own power assets and we'll get into where we get that power. We own our own Bitcoin mines and we manage them ourselves. So it, and instead of buying power from the grid or buying power from a, a utility um, and pay all the associated fees and expenses from that are added on to that, we generate the power ourselves. And then instead of paying a, a party to manage our data centers, we have built and managed those ourselves. And in theory, that should give us a higher flow through margin in what has turned out to be a really a tough business from a margin perspective. So the lower your cost of power, the lower that you can make those, the more the more money you'll make mining Bitcoin. That we really view it as as power arbitrage. So, you know, it's elevator pitches, we make our own power, manage our own assets, and we've we have greatly delevered the business in the past six months and really for the purpose of, you know, trying to survive this crypto winter. Gotcha. Well we'll dig right into the energy topic as we begin Waste coal is what you guys use for, I believe, most of your sites, maybe all of them. You can correct me in a yeah. second here. And basically, just I mean, I'm going to let you explain it. Waste coal is just like a bunch of excess of uh, coal that was not used during the 19th and 20th centuries for a lot of different production reasons. It's highly toxic. It's littered all across Western Pennsylvania where you guys usually operate. And you guys have figured out a way to reburn this, turn it into an environmentally beneficial uh, power source mine Bitcoin with it, and then there's excess ash that you guys can sell for fertilizer, if I understand it. So I'll hand it over to you. Really interesting structure that we have not seen from a lot of other miners. Yeah. So hey, what waste coal, it has the word coal in it. So it's, you know, it's a four letter word these days, but to be clear, we are remediating a waste coal problem that we didn't create ourselves. So we've been mining coal in Pennsylvania now for well in excess of a hundred years. It, until the mid 1970s, it was legal to mine coal and use the high BTU, use the good stuff, and leave the lower quality, lower BTU uh, material that was mined, is leave it on the surface next to the mine. And that has created, like, as you would know, going to school in Western PA, a giant environmental crisis for Pennsylvanians or really any coal mining area uh, will have this waste. Uh, product on the surface. So now there are literally more than 700 of these piles of waste on the surface, and they're not just sitting there, you know, quietly, harmlessly. When it rains, rain gets, you know, flows through them. That's what causes the rivers to run red in Pennsylvania. It's it's essentially creating, you know, kind of sulfuric acid or battery acid into the groundwater, into the rivers, streams, and lakes. Um, the only way to fix the problem. I guess you, you could try to spend the money to put this material back underground, which is, you know, a would be a multi-billion dollar futile exercise, or you can gather it up and burn it using, you know, technologies to eliminate most of the toxic emissions, like 99 point something percent of the toxic stuff that is in these piles that will end up in the atmosphere. If it's not cleaned up, um, we, t we take out and remove with our emissions controls. So, we really have a, we have two power plants, one in Western PA, one in Eastern PA, and we clean up millions of tons 
of this waste product a year. And so like as, as quote, an industry, we have the bipartisan support of Pennsylvania to clean up this mess. You know, that's, that's the legacy from, you know, hundred plus years of coal mining. And the, um, the benefit is we get a, we get renewable energy credits for the power that we make. We get waste coal tax credits for every ton that we pick up and, and, uh, re, you know, remediate. And that really helps us, um, obtain a cheaper cost of power, which is really important for Bitcoin mining. Um, it's that power arbitrage. So I think we really view ourselves as environmentalists, as remediating a, a crisis in the state. Um, we've got, you know, unfortunately about 15 years of this waste product still, you know, that, so that still remains to be cleaned up. Um, but when we do, if you know, go to our website, you'll see the before and after pictures, you go from like, what looks like a moonscape to, you know, a habitable, clean, you know, what, what looks like, you know, farmland or community centers. That's, um, that's, that's an important thing. I like guess, as, as you know, people may know. You, you, you have coal mining activity that is, you know, for 50, 100 years in an area, the mines are gone and shut down. The mining communities are, have been sort of depleted of, of most of their residents. It's, they tend to be sort of some of the poor parts of rural America now. And, you know, tragically, what's left behind is, say, the, the jobs are gone, the industry is gone, but the waste is still there. And so... The, you know, there, there really isn't a powerful voice for these people and these communities that have these piles that that remain. So we're happy to be part of the solution to be an advocate to, to clean up this mess. I want to talk about the engineering side, because I I think our audience really appreciate that as Bitcoin miners. My understanding is that the power plant type that came about that enabled you guys to reburn this coal or this waste coal came about in the 90s and it's like a pretty powerful design that allows you just like like burn rock of some sort and return it into energy so can you walk me through that a little bit yeah so to be clear if the stuff that we're that we are gathering up and burning if it were coal it wouldn't be there it would be already burned in a regular furnace of a power plant or it would have been used to make steel so this stuff is is not that it's it has a lot lower energy content per ton, um, or than um, than coal, but it does have you know coal attributes. So it has you know called between six and ten thousand BTU on average, or it might be more of a slurry. You know sometimes they'll say it's a, it's sort of powdery, so it wouldn't wouldn't belong in a or wouldn't burn properly in a a thermal coal plant. So our technology is is based on a a circulating fluidized bed. So you could go to YouTube and, and see like a Mark Rober video on on how do you fluidize like sand or a solid. And you're essentially um, pumping air into a solid and keeping it suspended. And that, so it's acting more like a liquid, which in this case, if you were to put this material like on the bottom of a, a regular thermal fired coal furnace or, or shovel it into like a locomotive engine, you know, of old, it, it would sort of burn, but smolder. It really wouldn't, um, it's not an effective way to convert it to ash. You know, it's, it's, uh, it wouldn't do it. And if you could do it, this stuff wouldn't be here. Right. So what we're, what our technology does is it suspends this material and because it's getting exposure to a lot more air and oxygen that way, it's able to burn. And so if, if you were to, to study this, it looks like we've got sort of, um, you know, seven story, you know, vertical tornadoes where you have this material circulating and, uh, we, we add limestone to it, which takes the sulfur out, which makes it much more friendly, you know, gets rid of the acid rain problem. Um, and we end up with this beneficial use ash as a byproduct and power as a byproduct. So you think if, if you want to make cheap power, you know, build a natural gas plant, um, you know, get, get hydropower. But if, if you want to remediate land, which is really what we were designed to do, um, power is a byproduct and this beneficial use ash is a byproduct. So that's, um, that's a bit about our technology. So they, the plants are, you know, it would cost a half a billion dollars to build one of these things today. They are 
you know, uh, scrub grass, which is a Western PA facility, is on about 650 acres. Um, and uh, Panther Creek is our Eastern PA site. Um, you know, our data centers are, are right there as well. Um, to me, like one of the most interesting things that we're doing today is benefiting from a really volatile power market. So, you know, people don't talk about it much. It's not, you know, in the news, but one of the effects of increasing the solar and wind to a, a grid is you make the grid less reliable. And if you went from, you know, coal-fired power plants and gas-fired power plants, um, and those run as, quote, base load power all the time. Um, and so that's that created a stable grid. The higher the percentage you add for solar and wind, the less stable you make the grid because, say, sometimes the sun isn't shining uh, or a cloud might pass or sometimes the wind isn't blowing or is expected to. And so what do you do? Well, like the solution today is the uh, people have been adding industrial scale batteries to the grid to instantly supply power when it unexpectedly goes away. Um, and that's a new need so that those batteries can cost upwards of a million dollars a megawatt. So I, we're not talking about it. Like who doesn't want clean base load renewable energy? Everybody wants it. Hey, but what if you heard that energy is going to cost you three times what your current energy bill is? So they'd be like, Hey, you know what? Maybe, but a lot of people can't afford that. So like, I'm really proud to say that we are part of the, the, the ecosystem that allows for solar and wind to be installed. And instead of adding that expensive battery, that which is a, you know, which is a probably one of the biggest contributors to, to driving the cost of power up and a, a, a big need to keep the, the grid stable, we can simply, when called upon, we can shut the data center off, that's mining Bitcoin, and we can do that within seconds at, you know, at the outside. Um, and that, that really replaces the need for a batter because it's essentially a giant load bank. Um, and so I think that's, that, that's going to have the effect of keeping a lid on energy prices while still allowing for the uh, more renewable sources of energy to be installed. Yeah, not to mention the the cost, the environmental cost of building those batteries, right? The, the huge pit mines they have to make all over the world uh, to extract the, the materials necessary, necessary for making these these batteries. Uh, I want to talk one more thing about the power solution that you guys have before turning to mining, mining economics in a little bit. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, the waste coal and like where these things are in Western Pennsylvania or throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Like just a, a meaningful sense of like how large these sites are that you guys are cleaning up and how much on a daily basis you guys are able to like extract from the ground or extract from, I guess it's sitting on top of the earth and yeah. uh repurpose well think about it this way i think probably the way to think about it, like in your mind's eye we'll have um when we're running full steam we will have uh 60 trucks running doing three three trips from five different waste coal sites in western pennsylvania um, the biggest of which is called russelton which is maybe 35 miles from the plant and uh you know, so call it, it's, it's almost 200 truckloads of waste is, is delivered to the plant, you know, every day that we're running. Um, and so that's, you know, Russellton is a 14 million ton site to clean up. Um, could have that wrong, but, uh, it's a, it's a, let's say it's, you know, there, it's been photographed as, you know, uh, and those photographs are visible online. Mm -hmm. It's just a, you know, it's sort of too big of a site to walk. You know, it's just constant excavators, bulldozers, moving that material, loading it up and shipping it off to, uh, to be cleaned. Um, so it's, you, you'll, you'll have, um, the state of Pennsylvania says that there are more than, than 700 sites to be cleaned up. And, you know, my, my bet is, is that, that's probably under counting. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got literally thousands of miles of streams and rivers that are impacted. You know, it really is a, um, 
you know, I, I think, hey, there are, there are those that, 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 that are, that object so strongly to adding any carbon to the atmosphere that say, hey, you should stop remediating and just leave these piles in place. Um, and you, you've heard, hey, why don't you just put a, you know, a foot of topsoil on top of these piles and then put some, you know, seed on top and it'll look pretty and be, you know, look grassy. Um, the issue is it still rains. The water makes it right through that grass, right into the waste pile. And that water ends up in the same streams that they end up in today. So that's a, you know, yes, you can have a beautification project, which is nice, I guess. Um, but in many cases, we are cleaning up the sites that someone else spent money to put topsoil and seed on. You know, and why is that? Because it doesn't fix the problem. So it's uh, it's it's hundreds of piles. And by the way, I think of those piles of the seven hundred piles, I think more than eighty of them are on fire right now and are smoldering. They get hit by lightning. They oxidize. So all the carbon that's contained in those piles is going to end up in the atmosphere. That's a, you know, a, over the decades, that is what the future of those piles will be if they're left alone. Um, when we re remediate them, we yes, we also burn those piles and put carbon in the air, but when, when we do it, we have emissions controls that gets rid, get rid of the truly toxic materials in there um, that are the cancer-causing ones, which, you know, carbon, hey, no one wants carbon in the air, but it's better than mercury, you know, or, or sulfur. Um, and so we're, we're really taking out the, the things you can't tolerate to have in the air that will be in the air and in the water if we don't clean them up. Gotcha. And yeah, your, your co-founder, Bill Spencer's vision for this is pretty interesting as well. From my understanding, he grew up in Western Pennsylvania. He was personally affected by this by himself and his family. Uh, and so you guys are on a mission to clean up that area. Tell me a little bit about how like Bitcoin mining and your guys' energy, uh, I guess, formula came together. How did those two things work out where you guys created this firm, NASDAQ listed, like the whole, whole nine yards when so many other companies are still trying to like figure out just like the Bitcoin mining part? Yeah, so hey, my my, um, my back, background is as an energy investor. You know, so I, I spent more than 20 years as a private equity investor with a focus on energy. That's how I got to meet Bill in the first place. He was one of the CEOs that I partnered with and invested in it as a part of my past. Um, and so through Bill, you know, I became familiar with what his expertise is, which is cleaning up these piles. Um, Bill ended up owning scrub grass as a part of his, you know, sort of journeyman um, experience in this space. And um he was he was beginning to mine Bitcoin sort of experimentally when Bitcoin was you know a fraction of even today's price, um, and so I, I had uh, left Apollo where I had spent ten years, and was mostly having you know an undisturbed sort of good time with my my kids. He sort of jokes that he was you know he disturbed me from trying to figure out how to bake croissants in my kitchen, which is you know, true actually. Um, <laughs> um, and so I, I began to get involved with Bill. And, um, hey, it became apparent that the capital markets were open for mining Bitcoin. It became apparent that, that, that the economics um, worked well and that the model of, of being vertically integrated, in my view, as an energy investor and energy expert, is the best way to run this business. Um, and so, hey, we, we sold, we, uh, we told the market the story and raised private capital, um, you know, a couple rounds of private capital, and then took the business public um, October 2021. So it's it's all it's happened really quickly. Um, you know, we have capacity for four exahash now, so we've gone from you know, essentially, you know, one um, pretty you know worn down waste coal remediation facility that's now been sort of fully refurbished. Bought another plant in Eastern PA called Panther Creek. Built out two two data centers. Bought all these mines, you know, miners um, or machines. Fully financed the business, and you know now we're, you know, struggling to get through crypto winter, which I think we're going to have an effective time doing. We've, you know, recapitalized the the balance sheet in a few smaller ways, um, and now we, you know, hey, we're in a position because we own our own plants. 
hey, we, we make enough cash to to get through it, we, we believe. So we, you know, in, in months where the power curve is, gives us more money than mining Bitcoin, great, we'll sell power. Um, and uh, of course we're rooting for Bitcoin and bit in half price and we'll we'll mine bitcoin when it's economic to do so so we have a instead of having just a one-way option on hash price we have an option on hash price and on power pricing both up and down and that's really that's this that's i i you know we told the story of the market believing it because it actually is true you know if you have the power curve collapses fantastic we'll shut the power plants down pull power from the grid and use that power to mine Bitcoin. If power prices go through the roof, fantastic. We'll shut the Bitcoin data center down and sell power um, um, yeah, to the to the grid, which we're able to do. Um, and then in between, we you know we arbitrage all the time where we're cycling the data center on and off to take advantage of even intraday pricing. Um, that's much more volatile than what we thought it would be, just given the. Um, the, the strangeness in the power curve lately. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about mining economics now. And you've mentioned the vertical integration a few times. Uh, I think most people in the audience will know, but let's, let's get a quick definition from you if you can. And then let's just talk about how you guys are able to able to mine through, uh, through your stack. I'm personally curious about how you guys having your own energy source and especially such an interesting one as, uh, as reclaimed waste coal enables you guys to mine for maybe a lower cost or maybe a subsidized cost, things of that nature. So, hey, our our variable cost to mine is probably around $30 a megawatt. And um, or, I'm sorry, available cost to make power is $30 a megawatt. So, a, it, and that's, that's, that's a, um, that's probably in the lower, you know, toward the lower end of what people ha are able to, to acquire power for. You know that are, that are miners. I think if you were to enter into a PPA today, you're probably looking at you know five to seven cents, you know, to to buy power and then have hosting services. So our our costs are a, are probably half of what it would cost you to duplicate what we have today. Um, we obviously have, we have fixed costs on top of that. So that's you know you would say hey maybe it's another ten dollars a megawatt or so. If you were to bake every, you know, all of the other costs in, um, and that's that. If and then if you look at the economics of mining Bitcoin, depending on which machine you have, you know, I'd say the latest and greatest machine, um, say an, you know an X X nineteen J Pro, you know, you might earn around ninety to a hundred dollars a megawatt would be your your revenue for on an X S nineteen J Pro. So it's a it's a wide margin today for that that machine um you know which which is why hey the mining business works and we're able to make cash i think if you looked at the at the fixed cost of being public the cost of servicing debt and you really need to have you know those low costs in order to to make cash after you consider the whole the uh the whole picture which hey, i think we're working on as far you know our, our, our final debt restructuring to make the whole ecosystem work for us, you know, which we have, we've had success in re restructuring, um, you know, our NIDIG debt where we, we gave, we actually gave the miners back to NIDIG in exchange for debt extinguishment. But now as they ended up, we're, we're now able to rebuy those same machines for a fraction of what we would have had to repay on that debt. Uh, we had a convertible preferred that we just uh, announced that we're exchanging for equity in the business. Um, so we, we really have come a long way in just making sure that we have a capital structure to survive. Um, you know, but hey, the, if, if we didn't, if we weren't able to make cash, then it would be okay. If, if you're just waiting for a higher hash price, I think we probably would have already, you know, given up. Um, but, uh, you know, thankfully the business with the current mining economics and the current power economics you know, we make more cash than we consume, and things are are pretty rough in terms of what the hash price is. You know, I think we're seeing have seen you know record low hash prices. If if you don't consider the the more recent run from Bitcoin, 
you know, I would describe them as probably an unsustainably low hash price. So meaning either people would have to, we would expect machines to come offline or Bitcoin prices to go up because I, I think most of the ecosystem really can't survive the hash price that we saw, you know, 10 days ago. Um, I would say, you know, we have, you know, for Stronghold, we have a, a, a blend of machine efficiency that ranges from call it $50, uh, break even per megawatt, um, all the way through the, you know, S19 J pro, which we talked about, say being around 90. Um, and so you'll see our data centers, they, there are many times during the day where power prices will be say $75 a megawatt and we'll be shutting down the inefficient segment of our data center. Um, and, and the good machines will keep running. So we are, you know, we're very sophisticated on that front to very, you know, to, to, to manage things in a, as efficiently as we can to capture as much economics as we can. Gotcha. I want to go back to the, uh, $30 per megawatt hour cost that you mentioned earlier. Is that pre subsidies or post subsidies when you're kind of looking at your, your total model, um, and no, the tax credits and all those things? Yeah, that's, that's including the tax credits, you know, so we, we get a, a renewable energy credit, which is the same as hydro and wind. And those credits trade for around, um, you know, lately around $17 a megawatt, which is, that's, a, that's a huge advantage to, to get Rex in this space. Uh, and we also get what's called a waste coal tax credit, uh, for every ton that we, that we clean up of this, of the waste. So that's inclusive of the, of the, uh, of the government programs, um, to clean up the mess. Gotcha. And I guess I'm kind of curious about this. Uh, so I'll ask a follow-up for the tax credit that you get for burning. Do you guys often just keep burning at your power plants as often as possible in order to get that tax credit? Uh, even if it's hash price is low and there's not really an incentive to keep the miners online. Yeah. You know what? No, we, um, Hey, if, if it depends on where power pricing is. So I have power mm -hmm. pricing. If you, if you get a, a quiet, you know, warm weather, winter weekend, yeah, you could see power prices in the mid twenties. And so then we'll have to do the math of, Hey, does it make sense to shut the machine down for the, the weekend and then restart it again on Monday? And I would say, hey, if we expected like low power pricing for to to last for weeks, yeah, we probably would consider having it having a shutdown, or or maybe we have a a mechanical issue at a at a plant that we know that in the next month or so we need to take care of. So maybe we move that shutdown from you know a month from now to to the low power pricing time. Um, and so I think I think as you would expect, these are just math questions. Um, you know, it, it costs about $50,000 to restart the plant if you shut it off. Um, and then there is a, you know, there is wear and tear. The things are not designed to be shut off and on like light switches. And so, you know, it's a, it's a lot of steel. The steel expands when it's hot and it contracts when it's cold. And, you know, there is a, a cost to a, a cycle. So um, I think a, our preference would be to, to stay running and our costs are, almost always low enough to have it make sense to stay running. And so I think for us to want to shut it off, we would have to ha have probably a, an expected maintenance event, um, plus a, an expected low period of, of power pricing to be willing to shut it off, you know? Um, and to keep in mind, able hey, to shut the plant off, we can still mine Bitcoin. You know, we just, we are then, then become power buyers instead of sellers. Mm-hmm. Thanks for entertaining that question. I was just curious myself. I uh, want to stay with finances for, sub for a second since you brought up the subject and then move over to talking about sort of like the implications and cultural impact that Stronghold is having in Pennsylvania and the Bitcoin space, uh, which I think are two interesting things that you guys are sort of fitting into. On the, the topic of finances, it's obviously been a really tough few months for every miner. Like go down the list of any NASDAQ Popco from Bitcoin mining They've all had restructuring, they've diluted, they've sold debt or they've bought debt, um, they've sold miners, they've sold facilities. So everyone's sort of in the same position and uh, I've just kind of taken that as a fact at this point. Curious about your guys' plays. So you mentioned the three things you guys have done to, to date. Uh, we don't need to go through those again. 
but I'm curious more so about what has been your thoughts looking back on the last two years and then the moves you guys have made in terms of finances uh, because of the decisions that were made 18 months ago, two years ago. Yeah. So, hey, I think we absolutely took advantage of a hot market when we went public. So hey, I'm, I'm, I'm proud as to how fast we moved um, to get public and to get access to you know, the capital that we needed to set up these these data centers, to refurbish these plants, to buy miners that we bought. Um, I'm happy that we structured most of our debt, like our, our senior debt piece uh, was with NYDIG, and that was designed as an equipment loan. So it wasn't senior debt. That was a, you know, hey, it was expensive debt, you know, but that debt gave us the option to either repay it or return those machines. And so, and that was a very, uh, you know, that, that, that good decision was made, you know, 18 months ago to structure the debt in that way. Um, and I think we owed, I think we talked about that past, if we owed something like $27 per tear hash on the machines, we can buy those same machines for probably $5 a tear hash. So that was an extremely, um, accretive decision that we made to return those machines, um, and have that associated debt ex extinguished. Um, and we, our, our existing senior lender has a, as a corporate guarantee, which was required when we refinanced it. And, and that makes it much more difficult to, to navigate. Um, and so I think, Hey, I think we will, um, Hey, we've obviously done our best that we have a business model that deserves to have, uh, deserves to continue to be funded. And so I think, I think that's, that's that's fully expected. So I think of of the decisions that we've made, hey, we've mostly been spot on, you know, uh, in terms of what you um, would have done. I think you can't. Um, hey, I think obviously Bitcoin is a a risk on security, and I thought if I'm surprised at anything, it's that. Um, you know, Bitcoin is really designed originally as a hedge for inflation and as a hedge against the government just printing of the trillions. Um, and so I think it's it's a it's unex it was unexpected, at least from my viewpoint, that that inflation um while I, I would have expected inflation to result in higher interest rates. That's the you know common cure to inflation. I'm surprised, and and I'm I guess that's going to then have its impact on the equities markets. Um, but I would have hoped that Bitcoin, you know, wouldn't have expected to be immune. But I would have hoped that Bitcoin would have traded up with the inflation threat rather than just down with tech equities, which is you know, hey, I, I guess that was maybe unknowable that maybe. You know, it clearly ran up with tech equities and maybe it shouldn't have been as much of a surprise that it, you know, has gone down with those same equities. So, um, and that was, that was probably the miss of the, the sector, including us. Um, yeah, do you always wish you could have done more to sort of hedge your, you know, um, your existence? Yeah, of course, but I'm not sure what we could have done. You know, we, we, if you, if you want to be in this business, it required debt and equity financing to get done. Um, and into the scale that, that, that we are, I think, Hey, we can't, we can't really underwrite, you know, um, Bitcoin pricing to return to 50,000 plus in the short run, but Hey, I'm still hopeful it, it's hanging in there really well, given the route in the, in the crypto space. I think, yeah, Bitcoin is different than other, you know, crypto uh, securities. Um, and so I think, hey, we'll see what happens. But I think we're still fundamentally believers um, in the in blockchain and Bitcoin as being the sort of the, the right crypto to, to be mining. Um, but hey, sort of as far as like reliving our financial history, I think we've mostly got it right. But hey, if you could relive, you know, some aspects of some agreements, of course you you would if you could. But I, I promise you, we got the, the best deals, that were available at, at the time that we, that we underwrote them. 
it, it we you know we we stress tested and i think we are we have lived through an environment that is that was probably much more difficult than we anticipated having to live through for sure mm-hmm. awesome appreciate the frankness there yeah it's definitely interesting to see uh the just looking back on the deals that haven't made and how those have come to light and see who's still running and I'm thankful that we've had some chapter 11 filings, but it doesn't seem like anyone's necessarily going under. They're just actually taking that restructuring and that pause to to rebuild things. And uh, there's some, and then there's others who are still you know, in the thick of it, still mining Bitcoin. I love that too. Let's talk about the cultural implications. So uh, first starting with Pennsylvania and then talk about the Bitcoin community for Stronghold and we'll end up uh, in the conversation around there. First with the community of Pennsylvania, I'm curious, has there been like a noticeable change in the communities you work with? Do you guys employ a lot of people in certain communities or people taking notice of the things you guys are working on? Yeah. So, hey, we we had, you know, if you were to come visit us during the build out of our data centers, you would have seen, you know, probably a hundred pickup trucks. Um, and hey, we were probably the highest paying employer in Venango County, which is a, you know, that's a, that's a, a tougher rural county in Western PA, you know, um, and our jobs are great jobs. So it's, you know, if you're a specialist running a power plant or a specialist managing a data center, um, hey, it's a, and you live around the plant, it's, it's one of the better jobs you can get in the county. Um, and so absolutely, absolutely people took notice. Um, and, you know, I think our supporters of what we're doing, like in a way, I think these plants, um, have been at risk, you know, of, of just being shut down and torn down permanently, which would be a tragedy for those communities because then they're going to be stuck with this waste pile for another 500 years. You know, there isn't a solution to cleaning up this mess without these plants. Um, so yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy that we have the community support, that have the state support to, to do the remediation that we do, and. A Bitcoin has helped make it possible to stick these to, you know, to keep the plants running and keep people employed. Have you noticed any pushback from environmentalists of any sort, or are they getting on the bandwagon and joining? You know what? It's they, those that were against remediation in the first place. They were against it before, and they're against it today. And I would say, hey, to the extent that someone can show us a a definitive way to clean up these piles in a permanent way. If that technology existed, where is it? Because people are, have been complaining about it, you know, since the piles have been around. And like I said earlier, it's like if you want to fantasize that that tossing some grass seed on top of a waste coal pile is going to remediate it, okay, it'll make it look better. But you know, you won't be drinking that water. Yeah, um, it's still going to wreck all the aquatic life and the and the you know the groundwater. So it doesn't really do anything. So I think it's a you know, those that actually are impacted by having a, a waste coal pile near them or in their community, they want these things cleaned up like the proper way, you know, not, not the fantasy way. But hey, if, if I would say, hey, thankfully, I don't think like lobbying against the cleanup of these piles, that hasn't really been an effective fundraising tactic for any of the environmental groups that might say they're against it. And so, and plus, hey, we've had a few of those guys even on site go, hey, what would you do? How can you clean this other than to just pick it up and do your best with getting the, the emissions controls out of it? And they'll say privately, that's the best thing you can do. It's the only thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, and maybe someday there'll be a way to sequester the the carbon that we emit in the atmosphere. I'll, I'll tell you, we are working on that, you know, on... On their on solutions around that today, like I'm not sure that we'll see it, you know, economically, um, but hey, we're working on it. Um, the 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 beneficial use ash that we create, that could be a great product for like a a carbon related um, concrete. So we're working on that. So it's a, you know, I would say we're hey, we're not sitting still. It's a dynamic industry, both on the, you know, Bitcoin side as well as the environmental side. And, you know, we're, we have, I think just what makes it interesting versus others, it's just the option. So, hey, mm-hmm. we can clean, we're cleaning up the environment. Maybe we could end up selling this ash for, you know, if it becomes and in, goes into a green concrete, that could end up being a whole other revenue line, you know, that, 
if Bitcoin doesn't go well, we might end up making more money as a as a carbon offset business. So I'd say just the optionality around our story is exponentially greater than most of our peers. And I respect, you know, what other people have built as well. Um, um, but I, if I had one complaint, it's I don't think it's recognized by the equity markets. Well, let's talk about the Bitcoin culture really quickly here. So on the environmental side, you guys might not get all the love that you deserve. And I feel like on the Bitcoin side of things, there's a lot of Bitcoiners, especially in the mining sector, who are very pro fossil fuels. They're not super worried about climate change. And so I do think from my limited purview that there hasn't been recognition of some of the green tech that's being produced and monetized by Bitcoin mining. And I would even put stronghold into that category since you guys do have a, a very strong story to tell. What's your personal take on on the Bitcoin community and how you guys fit into it? Uh, any critiques or thoughts or even praise uh, for how Stronghold fits into the, the category for miners or the Bitcoin community writ large? Yeah, you know what I would say? I think the Bitcoin community has done a really good job um, in the past, I would say, year at, at making a big effort to decarbonize. So you could say, hey, you know, Marathon abandoning the Harden facility. You know, that that's a... That that's that's a and they did it at a hard time for them. Like you know, um, and I think that that says a lot. And they're obviously, you know, uh, yeah, one of the bellwethers in this in the space. And so I think what they do speaks in a large part for the industry. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there there are industry groups that have been formed that communicate with politicians. That's a you know, so it's 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 an organized bunch. Um, I like guess if I had you know aspirations, it would be for the power regulators to recognize that the ability to toggle a data center on and off um, makes the grid stable. So it was like it's 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 government policy and in installing solar and wind that is that is a big contributor to making the grid unstable. And hey, that's not really we really shouldn't. You know, tripling the cost of electricity shouldn't be the cost of of renewable energy, but today it is. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, while while some want to be critical about the the you know related and em- carbon emissions that that Bitcoin has is is attributed, um, the industry would do well and regulators would do well to recognize that hey, stabilizing the grid. And not spending all this money on batteries that's going to increase people's cost of power and do a lot of environmental damage, you know that that you recognize as well. So that that maybe, you know, I think we're stronghold is, is a part of that, given that we, hey, we do cycle our data centers on and off as the grid needs our power, and I know others do it as well. You know, particularly a lot of Texan guys do it, um, and that's that's making a grid that would be a a. A bigger disaster than what it is, like just an unmitigated disaster. So I, hopefully we can we can start to sell ourselves as a solution to the green energy um, goal that we have as a country instead of a a problem that as we've been cast in the past. Love it. Okay, last thing we gotta get from you before we leave. It's January, start of a new year. What is your projection for the total online exahash of Bitcoin by the end of this year? So December thirty first of twenty twenty three. Where do you think we're at as a network for hash rate? You know, I I, I hope that I hope I'm wrong. Um, I, I hope we can keep a. Obviously, it's going to depend a lot on Bitcoin pricing, right? So, I I guess you know if we could see under three under three hundred exahash, that would be a a nice thing to to see if, if people don't go back yeah. just uh, you know, installing, you know, say more and more machines, but. Uh, I guess that would be a that would be a guess. I thought 260 now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it would be. Hopefully, we'd see a, a, a see a top off around 300. Okay, um, or less. 300 or less. Yeah, you and me both are hoping that. Greg, thank you so much for joining the mining pod. Appreciate your time greatly. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs>